if you were to ask me, uh, Omar, how are you doing? And I was like, great. Or you're like, Omar, how are you doing? Great. Yeah. Two wildly different responses. If, if, I, if you ask me and I'm smiling in one and then I'm scowling in another, your perception of how I'm doing will shift and change and be modified instantly based on what you're seeing and what you're hearing and then the way in which that makes you feel. So it's important, you know, as we learn to communicate with one another, we understand that delivery does matter. How you say things absolutely matters. The tone that you're using, the volume that you're using, the body language that you're using, these are very underestimated uh, skills that we, that we had to develop, I think are immensely underdeveloped with a lot of people that find themselves in these contentious situations where they're extremely frustrated with somebody and, and they can't seem to turn a conversation around. They can't seem to convey what they are actually trying to say because their, their delivery it could really be an issue despite how they actually feel about what they're saying or what they're trying to convey. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, that led me to something that I was just thinking of, which is going with something that you said earlier about um, the differences in our cultures. And I think that this is something that we have seen play out a lot on social media and in person, but especially in the last year when we've all been at home. And there's been all these different cultural wars, I would say, where one culture is trying to get the other culture to understand what goes on with them. And one might say, I, I know people in this culture. I'm friends with people. I'm dating a person in, within this culture. You know, like, so I'm very well versed in what you go through. How do you break those cultural lines? How do you explain your personal struggles and things that you go through without getting to a place where you get angered when somebody is coming to you from a place of ignorance but talking to you like they have they're the be all know all coming from a place of knowledge that can be a really difficult situation to be in i think um asking questions and trying to be understanding uh, especially if you realize somebody's coming from an arrogant or very ignorant stance, uh, it's very hard to break through with that person. And sometimes those conversations do hit a critical mass where there's no longer a beneficial outcome in continuing to talk to them. And we need to know when to walk away from conversations. That's an entire skill set by itself. But I will say in talking to somebody, it's understanding why they feel the way that they do, you know, understanding where they're coming from, the experiences that they've had that have led them to feel the way that they feel and, and asking clarifying questions. There, there isn't always the need to share your opinion on something. Uh, if you're dealing with somebody that culturally comes from a different place, that means you probably do not have a complete understanding of who they are, you know, the way that they're used to doing things, um, what is normal to them. These are things where you probably could, you know, glean a lot of insight and, and understanding for yourself. So I think learning to be tolerant by uh, participating in a conversation as an active listener and somebody who could ask questions to show interest, to show curiosity about the fact that somebody is alive somewhere that is living a life that's similar in many ways to the way that you live. But the way that they go about living this life is very different to the way that you choose to live your life. Uh, it could be difficult. So I think, you know, letting that person have the platform and really your full attention in explaining why there is value in the way that they're living, I think, could be an important starting point. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And it's something that you had told me before where you said a lot of times, we were specifically talking about for us, a lot of times our people shut those conversations down. Where it's like, if I hear something that sounds ignorant or stupid or it's wrong, I don't even wanna to talk to you, you're out. Conversation over, we're not gonna talk again. And you were like, that perpetuates the problem because now the person just walks away from the situation with the same beliefs that they had in the first place, 
Plus, they don't like you because now they have an experience with somebody that they were trying to have a conversation with about this certain topic and the person just cut them out, canceled them. Absolutely. It, it validates their point. And it, it's frustrating to both parties when they, they walk away because it really allows for both of them to feel validated about where they originally came into the, the conversation. You know, th- this, this person thought something about you. You thought something about that person. <laughs> Both of you left even more upset and validated in your feelings because none of you could come from a place where you could communicate effectively and be listeners. There was no understanding in that conversation that took place. So I'm not going to let you off the hook with this one. How do you know when the conversation is a dead end and it's time to walk away? I would like to know a breakdown of that. I think you need to know yourself. That's the first thing. You need to know your limits uh, emotionally. When you understand that you're boiling over and you're no longer in a position where you feel in control of your emotions and somebody is making you feel um, demeaned or belittled, uh, there's a capacity for the amount of that that any one person could really tolerate. And you need to know what your capacity is. You know, I heard a, a T.D. Jake's um, uh, speech that he was giving. Oprah was present for this one where he's talking about somebody's capacity for anything. I think it was love specifically in that example that he's like, I'm a 10 gallon bucket. So he has a huge capacity where somebody else might be a one gallon bucket or even a one liter cup. And that person just might not have the ability, the tools, the skills to be able to pour into you enough in terms of understanding or to be able to articulate themselves completely on how they feel because they're not even in touch with their emotions. So you might meet a conversation that is actually quite frustrating um, because somebody doesn't have the capacity to meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. And you trying to pour into that person might overwhelm them because your bucket is so full and has so much more to give than where that person currently is that as you start to pour into them, even though it's positive, even though it's with understanding or empathy, you could drown that person because they're just not somewhere where they could take what you're giving. So I think for you, the first place is just really understanding who you are, how you operate, the triggers that might bring you to a place that's not healthy for you, uh, where you need to take a step back. Um, and then you're actively in the conversation, practicing, you know, maybe setting boundaries in the conversation with the way that the tone of the conversation is going um, or certain subject matter Uh, within the conversation, you might understand that just really frustrating or difficult and you're not being heard or understood and you're explaining something and you just keep hitting a wall with this person where the same exact thing is being said and you're getting the same reaction. You try saying it a different way to bring more understanding and shed more light and you you're met with the same exact reaction and maybe even more intensity in a negative way from them. So if you're not really making headway in a conversation coming to even a mutual understanding of we do things differently, but I respect where you're coming from. And, you know, there's a difference of opinion. If you can't at least get to even that space, you have to start, you know, keeping a tally of, am I getting in a direction where this conversation is becoming more positive or, uh, or are we making headway where we have more of an understanding here and there's more mutual respect, you know, and that ground is what you're starting to make ground on, or is it moving in the opposite direction? And if it's moving into a negative space, that's not working for you or becoming emotionally overwhelming or negative for you, then it's a conversation you might have to step away from at that point. That was a great answer. And I've definitely had situations where I have stayed in that conversation too long because I was not at any point going to change their opinion. They didn't come into that conversation to try to come to a mutual understanding, like what you just said. They came in there for the conflict. So me participating in that conversation, they won because I was getting angry and they weren't. They were just, this is what they came to do. And learning how to walk away, it's definitely a boundary And it's definitely important for you. Uh, It's very good that you said knowing yourself first. Like that's something that I didn't even think about, but 
it's something that I can apply right away. I wanted to jump into another topic and the topic is therapy, going to therapy. I've been to therapy. I know that you've been to their therapy and I want to know what it took for you to actually reach out to somebody for that, what your thoughts on it are and you know, what your experience has been. I feel uh, it's different for different people. Um, I definitely am a big believer in not comparing trauma, comparing severity of trauma. Um, I think that we're also uniquely different that the way that we process things is unique as well. Our capacities are all different. Um, and going back to T. Jake's example, not everybody's bucket is the same size. Uh, not our capacities vary. And for me, I've always had a pretty significant capacity, e even as a child. Um, it might have been stubbornness in childhood, but over time, it definitely has developed my ability to have a lot of patience, a lot of restraint, um, and to listen and hear people better, to have more empathy. So as I went through more and more challenging situations and circumstances throughout my marriage, uh, I hit a wall of brokenness. I hit a place of doesn't matter what I thought my capacity was, my bucket was overflowing. Um, I felt as a 10 gallon bucket, guess what? You met a hundred gallon bucket that's pouring into you and you're drowning. Yeah. Um, and I think it took for me to get to a place of brokenness to understand that I needed help, to understand I needed to talk to somebody, to understand that I didn't have a solution. And I think hitting a sticking point sometimes uh, could be a good thing. For me, thankfully, it was where I was able to ask some questions and start to really look at my life, look at the choices I was making, look at, you know, my lifestyle, um, and then want to really seek out something different. And even going back, you know, to what I wrote in the yearbook in grade eight, like everybody yeah. has goals, kids have goals and dreams yeah. and aspirations, things we carry with us. So I think when you wake up one day and you realize how far off track you are uh, and that you're not happy, uh, you're depressed, uh, you're really anxious, you're really isolated, um, and life is just nothing of what you thought it was going to be, it, that introspective look for me was what broke the ice um, and, and started to make me have conversations uh, with people that I knew could be helpful resources that could point me in the right direction. Um, thankfully, I have a lot of friends, you know, that are in the field professionally. Um, and that's where it started with those conversations first. And uh, it's really difficult because I wasn't trusting. Um, it, it's hard to grow up where emotion isn't shown. It's hard to grow up where you set a foundation of not understanding how to process emotions to not have your emotions feel like they're validated, like they don't matter. Nobody's listening. Nobody really cares. You just have to be tough. Everything is being tough. Everything is, you know, we don't show this. It's, it's weakness. You're going to be made fun of, you know, and dealing with the years of that in school, you know, I mean, God forbid you were to start crying, you know, anywhere yeah. on our campus. You, wow. You know, and <laughs> Yeah. I think it's one of those things that, that made it extremely difficult to feel okay feeling and like a, giving yourself permission to, to actually cry or, and like feel that, feel everything that came along with crying. But again, when you hit your capacity, you don't even have a choice. And, and it got so deep for me that I no longer had a choice to cry. It wasn't about like, Oh, I'm going to think about these emotions and feelings, let it stir and brew. And then I'm going to have a peaceful, quiet moment to myself. Oh no, Th this was life. Didn't care where I was. Life didn't care what I was doing. It was a flood of overwhelming emotion that just felt like a tidal wave to the face. And it was raw. It, it was just your body releasing everything that was just built up. And I think hitting that kind of, you know, rock bottom emotionally, uh, there, there was no deeper to go for me, but up at that point. And it was you, when you have experienced what felt like embarrassment, what felt like such 
raw vulnerability and you're looking around, you might be by yourself. You know, I'm sitting by myself right now and just the idea of crying. It's like, you're looking around, like, is somebody else looking at me? Is there a camera somewhere that's going to record this? And those were the emotions and feelings that were, that were stirring. But when I realized that it felt so good to feel, it felt so magical to actually give yourself well, I didn't even give myself permission. I guess my body on autopilot gave me permission to just release and start crying and feel. Once I went through that, there there was such a positivity that flowed with that as well. It was so cathartic. It was just something that I was like, wow, you need this. You you need to, to unwind all of those tight coils of negative emotion and like figure this thing out because it was going back to remembering literally what I wrote in grade eight. It's like going back to those kind of memories of positivity, going back to the the speaking engagements in high school. You know, yeah. it's going back to feeding the poor. It's, it's going back to understanding like who you are, you know, what's actually inside of you and how far removed you currently are from that. And then like this longing desire to get back there, that, that those were my actionable moments. Those are the things that, that caused me to, to desire something more positive for myself and to start the journey that that has brought me to where I am now. I'm so glad you answered the question that way, because I asked you that question at that time intentionally, because I was going to ask you a follow up question about how you thought your upbringing impacted all of these things. And you actually gave this all encompassing answer that I don't even have to ask the question. So I'm just going to give you some follow up thoughts on what you said. I had a, I grew up in a totally different place than you, totally different family from different areas of the world. Um, But there's so many parallels still to what you were talking about. It wasn't a choice for me. It wasn't like, oh, you know what? I think I could use like a fine tuning. So let me go to this therapist and have them help me get to these things that I wanted out of life. It was like growing up, Every time I had a problem, I was a strong, silent type. I wasn't crying about it, at least not openly. I wasn't complaining. I wasn't telling family. I wasn't telling friends. I'm good. I'm good. I'm always good, no matter what happens to me. And if you ever saw me expressing myself at all, it's going to be anger. That's it. You're not going to see sadness, sensitivity, you're not going to see any kind of crying, anything like that. It's just going to be anger. You could ask anyone who was around me during those times. That's all you were going to see, if anything at all. But to myself, I would feel terrible about these things. And it was a buildup. It was a buildup and a buildup and a buildup. I don't have any healthy way to let this out. When you don't get it out, it's not like you're so strong that you can change that mind-body connection and avoid having any kind of negative response. For me, it was literally going all throughout my body. Every time something just really burned me or hurt me or was sad for me, and I just walked it off and brushed it off, it stayed with me and it stayed with me until it eventually became these panic attacks, which came from holding all those feelings and emotions in all the time, never talking about them, never telling anybody until the point where I hit such a low point, I lost the fear of embarrassment. I didn't care if somebody saw me cry in the car. I didn't care if somebody saw me looking wild and unkept. And I didn't care about any of that. I'm like, I'm just feeling so low at the basement that somebody just has to help me out. I need somebody. So I was at a level of vulnerability that I probably haven't even reached since, but I had definitely never reached at any point in my life. And just like you were describing those tears, the vulnerability felt the same way where I'm like, this is who I am. Everything's here. You can see it. You can hear it in my voice. You know, it shows all over me what's going on with me right now. And I'm just going to throw it all on the table and please help me sort this out. And that was like a a life changing moment for me to be able to do that. 
And it also made me think, if I had been able to do this in increments growing up, oh, this and this happened in school, I feel sad. You know, like such and such passed away and I'm crying. You know, this person said this thing to me and it, and it hurt my feelings and it hurt my self-esteem. And we have dialogues about this and somebody helps me work through it, then maybe I don't get to that rock bottom. I mean, maybe I do, but I have a much lesser chance of that. That's why I appreciate this conversation so much with you, because I'm hoping specifically that young people, young men especially, see things like this and they actually get those outlets. Or maybe the person our age that has a son, that is the ages that we were talking about at that time, is going to deal with their son a little differently and realize the world is already going to bring them down. Because the world requires men to have this certain status, this amount of money. They want them to have this certain type of car, this certain type of job. The world is built to bring them down. You, in the household, need to bring them up. I agree more. That's very, very well said. So do you think that if you were receiving these things in your household, that it would have changed the situation for you into your adulthood? And if so, in what way? Absolutely. You know, I actually had this conversation with my mom uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and these are hard conversations, you know, yeah. and I'm very, I'm okay at this point enough where I do not need to put the weight of like how I felt exactly and what I went through on her. I think that a realization of the fact that I wish certain things were different or that certain things were better, you know, um, that's one thing, but I definitely understand that my mom, the same way I'm learning to parent my boys, yeah. she was learning to parent me. You know, and there's a learning curve that goes with that, which then has created, again, a vast amount of empathy and understanding for her processes and her starting point. You know, I told her the goal for me is to advance and fast track and create such evolution between who she was and her capacities for parenting and her knowledge base and her understanding. I want to evolve so far past that that where she started and ended with me as a parent versus where I started. And then now I'm, you know, getting into the throes of, and will end as a parent are so night and day, they're unrecognizable from one another. They're completely different products. It has to look like a 1975 jalopy beater car versus like a brand new, you know, $2.5 million Bugatti Chiron. I'm a car guy. I'm sorry. But it has to look that completely different in terms of the mechanisms of change that have to take place. And a huge part of that's effort. It is extremely difficult. It's really raw. It is hard. It is painful. It is just so unbelievably vulnerable to put yourself in a position to be self-accountable, to look at yourself and say, you know what? A lot of things I make choices for every day, but there are a lot of things in the way I was raised and brought up where things happen to me. I didn't choose, my parents chose or life chose, and this is where I am. Is this the ideal place to be for me? Is this the capacity and the height of where I could get to? If the answer to that's no, well, guess what, buddy? You have work to do. And it's like one day I came to the realization that between me and getting better and giving my kids the best possible life and opportunities stood a tremendous mountain like not a mountain, like a mountain range of obstacles, hardship, and so much trauma to wind up having to recover from, process through, and not even just the trauma portion, but we have to talk about the performance portion. So like post dealing with trauma, like post recovery, now you could say, I have a much cleaner canvas. I have experiences and I have wisdom from these experiences where I feel healed and I feel better equipped to move forward. But then you had to learn a bunch of stuff. You had to learn how to be better than where you were and also better than where you are now in this like recovered state, which could be very active. You could still be in the process of doing it, but 
I had to learn how do I educate myself on communicating more effectively? How do I educate myself on being more empathetic? Because some of it's natural, but some of it I could do better. You know, how do I educate myself on being a more effective parent? Are there, are there skills that come with this? Are there tools? Are there methods, you know, of parenting differently? Are there methods for how we correct our children differently? Like if I didn't like, you know, being reprimanded harshly, I didn't like spankings. Are there other methods that exist? You know, could I utilize maybe talk therapy and sit down, you know, and actually understand the behavioral patterns, you know, and the thought processes and the emotions that are flooding into my child, causing them to behave in this way. Absolutely. Does that take way more time investment? Massively. Does that take a lot of patience? Yes. Am I willing to put in that effort? Well, there, therein lies the answer as to whether or not you're going to be able to evolve. It really comes down to effort, you know, and that's like a hard reality for people that a lot of people are so complacent. A lot of people just are so unwilling to do the hard stuff to get better that they will settle for where they are. They'll settle for average and mundane and regular. They'll settle for less than because it's really difficult to get better. And there's such a mountain range in front of you. And it's accessible to almost everybody, but not everybody is willing to do it. Yeah. Um, that's a really deep statement right there that is accessible to everybody, but not everyone is willing to do it. Uh, it just goes back to what I was saying earlier, that people tend to think that just knowing what the previous generation did that wasn't working for them automatically means that when they get put in that position as their parents were in, just knowing that is going to make them do better. But just like you said, it's not just knowing. If you haven't seen the better, you have to learn what the better is. It's, oh, I got yelled at. I got right. hit with the belt. So I'm just not going to hit them with the belt. Number one, you probably are. Because once you get into that situation and your kid does this thing, that's ingrained in you. You did Your dad did it. Your grandfather did it. His, his father did it. His father and grandfather and great grandfather did it. So we are intrinsically just made to do these things that were done before, unless, just like you said, we actively learn how to do better. We learn what the better is and we start practicing, working on it actively to evolve. Otherwise, everyone down the line is going to do all the same things that the last one did. You have to put in so much work to be that person that's like, I'm going to break the cycle, whether that means the form of correction, whether that means work, entrepreneurship, being the person who is, like you put in your eighth grade yearbook, the most successful man in your family. What does it take? What does it take to do that? You especially if everyone's been following a certain pattern that basically puts them in the same place. And it might be a good place. If it's a place where your whole family is poor, then you might be more motivated because you're like, you know what? We don't even have what we need. And I don't want to be in that position anymore. But what if your family is average? What if they're middle class and you do have everything you need but you are not living the life that you want. It takes a special something. And then the people around you who have done it before might be telling you, Omar, I know that you're saying that you want this thing, but honestly, this is how it goes. This is life. You know, like this is what your dad did. This is what your grandfather did. This is what your mom did. This is what your, your aunts and uncles did. Like everybody tries to break the cycle and ends up in the same place. So don't even try. That's huge. That, that is um, one of the most envenomating thought processes that you could ever allow into your consciousness when you're trying to evolve and become better. It's literally something that is injected into you that becomes neurotoxic. It, it is something that starts to shut down your ability to move forward and progress forward. And usually, and very 
fortunately, it comes from those who are the closest to us. It's often going to be family or close friends that have such self-limiting beliefs because of patterns of behavior that they have been used to that just have existed. And maybe they gave it a good old try, you know, and put in effort to change things and got really frustrated hitting a wall of not being able to. Maybe some people really didn't even try. But whatever the narrative actually is for the truth of what happened in their life, that person is self-limiting and thinking it cannot be done. And when they see your struggle and it's familiar to what they went through and they see that same glimmer of hope in your eye of I'm going to do better, I'm going to break the cycle. Usually it's these people that are the first to be discouraging, that are the first to tell us, man, you know, I know you wanted to do it, but there's no way you're going to be able to break what has happened. It's happened for generations. You know, your dad did it. Your uncles do it. Your grandfather did it. His dad did it. So the world is stacked against you to be able to change it. The question is, has change like that been done before? The answer is yes. So it's possible. We know it's possible. What will it take, though, to effectively create that change? And how big is that? When you map it out, what do the math on it? You know, I, I hear like Grant Cardone always says that. Do the math on it. You know, whether we're talking about finances or we're talking about a situation, truly take the time to map out what it would look like and what it would take for you to change where you are, where your family's legacy currently is, and for you to be the vector of change that winds up being the evolution of your family legacy and the name that now is known or now is left behind and what you instill in your children, the generations to come. When you look at that work, it's going to be a mountain. Nobody gets a little baby hill. It's a mountain for people that are coming from such deficit. It's so daunting. A lot of people quit and give up because of how insurmountable it seems. They don't even take the first step, you know? And I think that allowing for somebody to rob you of the opportunity through the poison that is their negativity doesn't even allow you to start. And it's one of the worst things you could ever do for yourself. Uh, I really appreciate that answer. And I also appreciate you taking the time for this interview. I know that we're going to have several more. And as a matter of fact, we are, we have a lot of projects in the works that people are going to learn about later. So almost every single one of the points that you made have a whole conversation behind it. <laughs> so I'm going to have to separate these out and get to each of those individually. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to ask you as a kind of final questions. Number one, would I ask my guests, what is your personal definition of a champion? Champion is somebody who could realize where they are, could realize what's stacked against them, but has the heart to never give up despite the circumstances around them. I like that. Somebody who has the heart to never give up despite the odds being stacked against them. And I want to know if you have any final words of encouragement for the people out there, especially for the men who are experiencing things that are feeling so insurmountable, but they don't feel like they have anywhere to turn and they feel like it's not going to help them anyways because they have to just figure this thing out on their own. You're never truly alone. Um, the support that you might need might not be where you are. The support that you might need might not be right around you, might not be within your family or your friend circle. Um, change is hard. Transitions are hard. But finding that, being a, like just relentless about the pursuit for wanting to be better uh, is super important. And it starts with small steps, just really small things, uh, just affirming positivity every day, telling yourself you can, being real and honest with yourself, looking yourself in the mirror, literally looking at yourself in the mirror and seeing your face, seeing what's in your eyes and knowing what's looking back at you and being honest with yourself about it is a really good starting place sometimes. Um, and take the small steps, even when it looks like you're not getting anywhere, because eventually you'll look back at a hundred or a thousand or a million small steps taken and realize that you really have made a transition. You really have moved forward. There really has been 
tangible progress um and be kind to yourself that that's probably the last thing give yourself grace give yourself kindness in knowing that it's going to be hard and knowing you're going to fail a lot knowing that you're going to fall on your face and it's not about getting it right every time but it's about the pursuit of trying to get it right every time trying to get better and always constantly working on yourself and evolving that's a great thing to sign off with appreciate you once again and see you all next thank time thank you so much